Hi folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for listening to the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. Today's guest is Dr. Lauren Cordain, best-selling author of The Paleo Diet. So this is pretty cool. After last week's show with Tim Ferriss, we popped up to number three in the United States in the health charts on iTunes. So it's just the beginning of 2013. We're already up there, and hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll be able to once again knock Jillian Michaels off the top spot. And a quick reminder, if you haven't already, you can go to fatburningman.com and download a bunch of free bonuses and eBooks for the next few weeks. So make sure that you do that and get free updates as well about the show and other things that we're up to. All right, so in today's show, we're here with Dr. Lauren Cordain, who's considered to be by many one of the founders of the paleo movement and the world's foremost scientific authority on the evolutionary basis of diet and disease. Lauren is, of course, the author of the groundbreaking The Paleo Diet, as well as The Paleo Answer, The Paleo Diet for Athletes, and The Paleo Diet Cookbook. In today's show, we talk about the most compelling scientific evidence for The Paleo Diet, a bit of the history of the paleo movement, and why Dr. Cordain's stance on saturated fats and canola oil has changed. All right, let's go hang out with Dr. Cordain. All right, folks, today we're here with the author of the best-selling The Paleo Diet, Dr. Lauren Cordain. It's an honor, Dr. Cordain, so thanks so much for joining us. Hey, Abel. I'm uh, very happy to be on your program. Yeah. There's so much that we see in the paleo movement today that is based upon your research. So can you actually give us a bit of background about your work and and how you came to be, in essence, the godfather of the paleo movement? Well, you know, thanks for the compliment, Abel. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, my mentor, Boyd Eden, Eaton is really the, the godfather of this whole thing because I would have never uh, got into it had it were not for Boyd. Sure. And uh, he wrote a paper in 1985 that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine called Paleolithic Nutrition. Mm-hmm. And I read that paper two years later, and I thought it was just about the best idea I'd ever heard. Yeah. So that's kind of how I got started in it, and uh, I did a lot of my own reading, and, and I finally uh, got up enough courage, and I, I called Boyd on the telephone. He's a a working radiologist. He's also a part-time faculty member at Emory University in Atlanta. And we had a great conversation, got to know one another. I invited him up to CSU to give a talk. And about a year later, uh, he invited me to go to an international conference on nutrition and exercise in Athens, Greece. And uh, I met a lot of the, the people, major players in nutrition and and uh, exercise at that international conference, mm-hmm. including Artemis Simopoulos, who was a, an editor of a number of medical journals. And uh, we spent some time with her, and she asked me, and I had mentioned that I'd been writing a paper on the adverse effects of cereal grains, and she said she'd be willing to publish it. So I'd been working on it for almost a year and a half, and I got it together in the next six months and finished it and sent it to her. She published it. And, and then I started publishing together with Boyd in the scientific literature. So that was kind of really how the whole thing got started. And, and that was, as I mentioned, uh, oh, probably the mid-90s, 95 yeah. or 6 or so. Mm-hmm. Then I, uh, I met Rob Wolf in 2000. He, was, uh, he had all kinds of health issues, and he had, and the Internet was real young in those days. And so he had stumbled on this paleo diet concept through Art Devaney's website, and then he finally found mine. And uh, I, I, of course, had known Art for a number of years because he and I had been corresponding for a while. And then Rob decided to come down and and work with me and try to get a Ph.D. here at CSU. Mm -hmm. And so it it didn't work out for him. He was here shortly, and uh, he moved back up to Seattle. And then he and I kind of kept in contact, but not a whole lot. Uh, until, oh, I don't know, maybe 2007 or 8, we started to uh, reconnect. And, uh, you know, of course, Rob uh, is another major player in the, the whole paleo movement. Sure. So we had reconnected. And, and uh, you know, I think that's how things uh, really got to be uh, so viral. So that was in the, you know, 2007 or so. And it's only been since about 2009 or 10 that I think this thing has gone absolutely viral worldwide. One of the the factors that kind of substantiates that is uh, the number of paleo books. So I wrote my first book, The Paleo Diet, uh, um, back in 2000. It was published in 2002. Mm-hmm. And 
at the time, there was really only two books on paleo. There was Boyd Eaton's book, uh, Paleolithic Prescription, that was written in 1988, and mine, and that was it. Wow. Now, fast forward to 2013 <laughs> and go to Amazon and type in paleo, and I think you get a, over 700 books. So Is that right? Yeah, it's, wow. it's absolutely amazing. And, and the number of websites, too, and I'm sure you're aware of this, sure. uh, Bolt, is that the number of websites are you know in the tens of thousands. Uh, if you do a, a Google... Uh, search on paleo, you come up with five or six million <laughs> <That's> uh, hits. <laughs> <laughs> really so, yeah, so I, I think if you did a, a Google on paleo, and you know, back in well, when Google got going, you, you didn't get any hits. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of crickets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so obviously, it has exploded. So, why do you think that's happening now? You know, I, I honestly believe in, I've, I've written about this in, and I, I revised my first book, The Paleo Diet, in 2010, mm -hmm. and in the introduction to that book, I, I, you know, I've been asked that question so often, uh, I've written, a, a, you know, three or four or five pages on, on why I think it happened, and I think the big thing is uh, the internet, and yeah. remember, when I wrote my first book in 2002, uh, Google was only a couple years old. People didn't use, uh, you know, weren't such thing as smartphones or people <laughs> use regular telephones. And, you know, all the things we take for granted is Facebook and, and all the other social media that people uh, connect with that sure. simply didn't exist uh, back then. Mm -hmm. And so as Google started to become more and more popular, people got into Facebook and social media and all these things that we now have, um, they talk to one another. and. Yeah. We have blogs and people. Everybody can talk to anybody. And when you come up with a good idea, it, it travels fast. So if somebody figures out a solution to, you know, something on the federal income tax return, everybody figures <laughs> it out. <laughs> so we all get it. And, and that's, I think, what, what happened with paleo is it was a pretty good idea, and um, it works. That's yeah. the bottom line. It works. And so people that have health problems, people that are, um, interested in becoming more fit, increasing muscle mass, losing fat, and, you know, it works. And, uh, you know, if it didn't work, it would have died a very rapid death. Yeah. So if it would have caused your cholesterol to go up, uh, if it was impossible to follow, uh, you know, and it made you feel lousy, people wouldn't do it. So I think that really the Internet and people's anecdotal experience, and I'm sure you can say the same thing. I know you're a huge uh, uh, supporter of the concept and absolutely I think that you probably have you probably know hundreds or thousands of people that are doing this uh, oh, yeah. in your own experience and it works it works yeah <laughs> it, it works so much better than than the cabbage soup diet <laughs> and i don't even know what that is so uh, <laughs> it doesn't sound very good and that's what and that's why rob did it you know yeah. so rob was doing a the vegan vegetarian thing and i did that myself years ago and it, the vegan vegetarian thing just didn't work for me. You know, right. I had all kinds of health issues, and I was a runner, and I was constantly getting upper respiratory things mm -hmm. and uh, low back pain and all that kind of stuff. And my wife and I first adopted paleo back in uh, about 91, I'd say. We got okay. married in 1990, and we gave it a go about a year later, um, and we've been doing it ever since. And at the time... Uh, Lori and I were probably the only two people on the planet eating in that in this way, yeah. except for hunter gatherers. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's been it's been a a wild ride, uh, Abel, and I, I'm so grateful <laughs> to all the people, your listeners uh, and readers as well, that have adopted this. And uh, you know, those are the folks that made this all happen. So I, I don't really look upon myself. It's uh, you know, I was kind of there at the beginning, and I thought it was a great idea, and have continued to promote it in uh, the scientific world. And, and I think that's really kind of what I can bring to the plate, oh, yeah. is, uh, is kind of the credibility that comes from the science and the scientific papers that we've written on this topic over the last 15 or 20 years. Right. So what is some of the more compelling evidence from a scientific perspective uh, about the paleo diet generally? Well, I, I think the the first approach that we took, and again, this is not my idea per se. This is Boyd Eaton's idea. Sure, is he said that uh, we ought to look at the nutritional characteristics of our hunter gatherer ancestors, and then we ought to try to emulate those um, using foods that are commonly available in the Western world. Mm -hmm. And in Boyd's <clears throat> book that was published in '88, he didn't get it completely right because he 
he suggested that people could still eat whole grains and dairy products. Right. And uh, so I was kind of the first guy to come out, at least in the popular press, saying that uh, maybe we shouldn't be eating whole grains or dairy products. And I took it one step further, and I said we probably shouldn't be eating legumes as well. Right. Um, and so that's kind of, uh, uh, you know, what I brought to the plate in addition to what Boyd did. And then <clears> – <throat> In terms of compelling scientific evidence, uh, it's it's really compelling that uh, our Stone Age ancestors didn't uh, consume dairy products simply because they weren't available. Mm-hmm. You can't milk a wild animal. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's a great image. Here in Colorado, we have a lot of wild animals. We have elk and, and deer and bison and everything else. And, and anybody that goes hunting realizes not only can you not milk it, you can't even approach them before they <laughs> run away. <laughs> right. <laughs> So the the whole point is is that uh, until you domesticate animals, uh, it's impossible to consume dairy. So to me, that's a pretty compelling argument. The argument against cereal grains um, is probably a little bit less compelling. I think that hunter-gatherers, uh, if we look at the historical records, um, they consume grains, but not as staples like we do now. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were only available seasonally, and they were typically looked upon as starvation foods. Right. Now, there's, there's some exceptions to that uh, in, in very dry areas of the planet. Um, uh, grains by hunter-gatherers were consumed in, in greater quantities. But for the most part, uh, uh, grains really weren't consumed. The notion behind... Uh, legumes is that legumes are toxic unless they're cooked. Almost right. all legumes um, people don't do very well in their raw form. There's some exceptions, but uh, for the most part, uh, uh, they're, they're toxic in varying degrees to our, our GI tracts. So right. Until we mastered fire, um, and when I say mastered fire, that was the ability to start it, stop it, and start it again. Mm-hmm. And uh, that probably... Uh, didn't happen until uh, earlier, fairly recent times with the invention of the fire stick. And so archaeologists and anthropologists, uh, we don't have a real good idea when the fire stick was invented. Um, the other way of making fire is simply gathering it from lightning strikes or volcanic eruptions. And uh, we're relatively certain that uh, people as far back as 300, 400,000 years ago were using that procedure but it was a sketchy uh, business because uh, you had to keep the fire going right. <clears throat> between lightning strikes. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, we've come a long way. Yeah, we've come a long way. And and when we look at uh, you know the archaeologic record, we look at um, there's isotop isotopes. These are elements that are found in bones of extinct uh, humans. Uh, we can get a pretty good handle on what they were consuming. So. Right. Uh, that, that's really what we're trying to do, and um, it, I, I'm absolutely amazed how far-reaching the effects of this diet are. You know, when I first uh, started doing it myself, I knew that it was going to be um, therapeutic for people that have high blood cholesterol, risk factors, cardiovascular disease, mm-hmm. type 2 diabetes, the metabolic syndrome. I knew that it was going to be helpful there, but I didn't realize how far-reaching the health effects are, and only need to go as far as Rob Wolf to see how therapeutic it can be for people with uh, autoimmune GI tract problem like irritable bowel syndrome, mm-hmm. ulcerative colitis, or Crohn's. And uh, if you have any listeners with those diseases, uh, boy, get them on the paleo diet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and <laughs> the effects, like you said, uh, when you start eating clean and in this manner, so many things that you assume to be just part of who you are, you know, as you get older, certain things happen, you, you just get slower, worse, sicker, um, suddenly disappear. They're not a part of you anymore. You just become <laughs> like a healthy, functioning human being. But for those of those people out there who might not know Rob Wolf's story, I, I think a lot of people obviously know who Rob Wolf is today, but obviously he did have a lot of health problems when you met up with him. So can you explain, I guess, his state at that time? Yeah, you know, I think you can go to his website and his books, and he, um, the Paleo Solution, and, and he pretty much lays it out. But yeah. uh, uh, what I, from near as what I can tell, is you know Rob was a a really good athlete and uh, near world class, and he decided that he was going to try to get even better by going on a, a vegan vegetarian type diet. You know, mm-hmm. eating a lot of beans and brown rice and no meat. Um, 
and the typical fare that uh, people that go on these things eat. And uh, he ended up losing weight, um, having all kinds of bowel problems to the point where I guess he was thinking about having his GI tract resectioned and just nice. all kinds of you know horrible things were going on. And uh, I think that he got on the internet at the time, and and again back uh, in you know 19 the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, you know people didn't think about going to the internet for information, sure. uh, whereas now everybody does. So he found he got on the internet, and I believe that he found Art Devaney's website. Uh, and Art and I, of course, had known each other. This was about 2000. We'd known one another for probably three or four years again, through what was called listservs in the day, and mm-hmm. they're equivalent to what blogs are now. And so sure. there was a small group of us that were interested in paleo. We didn't call it paleo at the day because that name really hadn't come up. But we were just uh, scientists and anthropologists that were interested. And so we corresponded with one another on the listserv. That's where I met Art Devaney. Uh, I met Mike and Mary Dan Eads on that list serve. I met Jenny Brand Miller and, and many of the, the names that uh, if you go back to the early days of Paleo, that's where it really where we all started talking to one another. Very and, cool. Uh, yeah, it was. It was very cool. And uh, Rob, um, so Rob ended up uh, adopting Paleo. He got the beans and the grains out of his diet, started eating meat again, fruits and veggies, uh, no wheat, and uh, he miraculously recovered within a couple of weeks and uh, got his strength and everything came back. And, uh, and so he uh, really became a major supporter of this and started uh, his own uh, website. And, you know, at the time uh, in the, the mid two thousands or so, I think many CrossFitters were doing, uh, they weren't necessarily doing paleo. Right. Um, so, I think that Rob is is the person that really got things going with uh, the diet and the the whole notion of paleo challenges, which we now see all over the the world and all over the country where in CrossFit gyms people um, do this for anywhere from a couple of weeks to a month or so, and then they they chart their progress. Right. And then they're just like, wow, this works. (laughs) Yeah, it does. And can I ask you, Abel, how, how did you come upon paleo? I actually came upon it in, in kind of a backwards way. I remember um, seeing your book around the original The, the Paleo Diet, and I've always been a, a total nerd for health-type things. Um, but I actually came from more like the macronutrient perspective. I was dabbling in the fringes, going on bodybuilding forums, reading a bunch of scientific research, some of it wasn't uh, wasn't well accepted by me at the beginning. I remember reading some of the research against cereal grains, and I'm just like, "Oh no way, <laughs> no way! It can't. We can't be this wrong as a society, you know." Um, and and so then I realized as I kind of came to a similar conclusion of paleo from a macronutrient perspective, as then combining that with real food, that other people are doing this too. And that was around you know 2009, 2010 that I found uh, some of the major blogs, Rob Wolf, Mark Sisson, and, and all these other websites started popping up. And I'm like, wow, other people are doing this too. This is so cool. And then, uh, of course, since then, it's just absolutely exploded. Yeah, it really has. There, there, I think there is kind of a demarcation point there. And that's just about the time that Rob's uh, book came out. I think his book uh, appeared in, I don't know, I want to say January of 2010, mm-hmm. somewhere in that time. And so... Um, you know, his uh, his blog and his website are just wildly popular. His podcasts are are famous. You know, so he, yeah, he's a, he's a real interesting, not only interesting and knowledgeable, but he's a funny guy. Oh, know? he's a great guy. <laughs> yeah, and so that uh, that that kind of really sells it. And like I said, it's like a snowball running downhill, mm-hmm. Abel. You know, it's you get a good idea, and people uh, uh, people tell their neighbors. And, right. It's all over the media now. I mean, I you know, not a day goes by when somebody else discovers it at some newspaper or some dietitian mm-hmm. somewhere says, oh, okay, there's this thing called paleo. And, of course, you know, like yourself, they, they were skept- they're skeptical at first. Is right. How in the world can you cut out an entire food group, yeah. i.e. cereal grains? Well, Abel, there's no human nutritional requirement for grains right. okay you know we can, <laughs> we can we can we can get by just fine without grains and yeah. we, as a species we got by just fine for two and a half million years so um 
you know, there's no nutrient that grains have um, that you can't get from any other right. um, food. So uh, the the problem with grains is that they have a lot of, of, of downsides to them, and they mm-hmm. contain numerous anti-nutrients, particularly wheat. Wheat is a very nasty substance. It's ugly. And, you know, the whole idea of paleo goes right along with gluten-free. What are the biggest things, what are the hottest new trends now in diet and nutrition? Gluten-free and paleo. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, paleo was the original gluten-free diet. Mm-hmm. It's just built in. <laughs> And I think that there's a lot of people that don't have, you know, full-blown celiac disease, but they have problems with wheat and with right. gluten. And, yeah, I'm one of those. Yeah, and, you know, I, I was one as well. I didn't have celiac disease, but, boy, once I got wheat out of my diet, you know, things really started to improve. And mm-hmm. one of the things that I think people – is your mental state. Your mental state, uh, I think, is a lot more even when you get gluten out of your diet. So gluten actually – and, and there are components in, in uh, wheat that are called exorphins. Mm-hmm. And like you've heard the word endorphins, exorphins are the same thing, is that they bind receptors in the brain and they alter brain function. So we've known this for years and years and years, and uh, 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 psychologists have known this as well. There's a guy by the name of Dohan, and back in the 60s he ran a number of experiments with schizophrenics and then people with depression and other psychological issues and he took them off wheat and uh, he publishes it in the scientific literature it was kind of buried and you know people didn't listen to it but right. there's a lot of good evidence now um, to show that indeed uh, wheat does alter brain function so uh, wheat is a, a very nasty substance and it's got multiple elements in it uh, that seem to affect uh, normal physiologic function so, right We've done experiments here at Colorado State University in which we've actually analyzed a compound called wheat germaglutin, and it's a, what's called a lectin, and it's found in wheat. And we were interested in seeing is if after people ate wheat, did this stuff get in the bloodstream. Mm-hmm. So our first experiment, uh, we were looking in the wrong place. So uh, we were looking in uh, what's called plasma, and what plasma is is, is the liquid portion of blood. And uh, we believe then that WGA does not bind any of the plasma proteins, but it actually binds the red blood cells. So when you draw blood from somebody, you spin it down, you throw out the red blood cells, and you, you keep the plasma. So we threw the baby out with the, bla- <laughs> the bath <bathroom. laughs> And where we should have been looking was in the red blood cells. So, yeah. so anyway, we've, we're, we've gotten closer to it, and, but we uh, firmly believe that WGA does get into blood plasma, and it's a... It's a nasty, nasty compound once it gets in the body. Right. And anecdotally, myself and I know a lot of my fans and followers, as, as soon as they eliminate wheat, all sorts of beautiful things happen. I know that when I was uh, eating a lot of it, I just had this this hunger that would never seem to go away and all sorts of digestive upset. I had trouble sleeping. Uh, and man, it's a beautiful thing when you get rid of all that. Yeah, I think that's the, really, that's one of the, you know, when you go paleo, that's one of the major factors is getting wheat out. I, and I think some of the other grains are also problematic. Sure. Um, getting dairy out seems to help a lot of people. Some people can do paleo with bits and pieces of dairy. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think we need to be dogmatic about it. I mm-hmm. think people should always listen to their body and see what works for them. Right. So, um, there are different versions of paleo. It cert- by certainly is no means do Rob Wolf or I or Boyd Eaton have a, you know, the inner uh, answer to this whole thing. So it, sure. it, but, and it, it is. It's evolving. As uh, you know, pe- more and more people get involved with the the concept. It it kind of has a changing face. But I can say one thing: is the basic concept is correct. And yeah. so go back to 1985 and what Boyd Eaton wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine. That basic concept will never change, and mm-hmm. what we're doing right now is simply fine-tuning it. Yep, and so as you say, your, your views on a few specific subjects have evolved, specifically saturated yep. fats, lean, means, lean meats, and canola oil. So can, can you clear the air on that? Because I know that... Yeah, you know, and I, I guess that you know, once you get tagged with something, you're, you're kind of branded with that forever. And to me, that's not how good science works. Right. Good science... We always try to let the data speak for itself and not let charismatic individuals guide us down the wrong path. 
So we need to let the data speak for itself. And that's kind of how I've always tried to operate. Mm -hmm. And so when I wrote my first book in 2000, when I started writing it, all of the meta-analyses showing that saturated fats were not necessarily a good thing, that's what the evidence was in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. There was very little scientific evidence to show otherwise. And there's also pretty good uh, cellular evidence to show how this whole process works. So the, the notion of the LDL molecule and the LDL receptor, that the LDL receptor in macrophages is actually upregulated with saturated fat mm-hmm. rather than downregulated as it is in the rest of the body, that, that won the Nobel Prize in medicine uh, for Brown and Goldstein in 1984. So mm-hmm. that, that kind of evidence is, is indisputable. But the new evidence that came out starting in about 2009 and 10, in which we looked at meta-analyses, and when you take large population studies in which you use hundreds of studies, all, virtually all the studies that have ever been done, and you combine them, then it really gives us uh, much more insight. And so when those meta-analyses were finally carried out by Moses Farian at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, what we discovered is that saturated fats had a, a very minimal effect upon atherosclerosis. And mm-hmm. mechanistically, we now know, which we didn't know in 2000, is that inflammation is one of the major players in atherosclerosis. Right. And so the key is, is what are the elements that are driving atherosclerosis and inflammation? So we believe that when you do paleo um, and you eliminate processed foods, grains, and dairy, uh, that many of the uh, inflammatory antigens uh, they get into our GI tract or removed. So we think that uh, saturated fat actually has very minimal effect on atherosclerosis. And I, you know, I, I was branded with that notion in from 2000 on, even up to this day. And if you go to my website, I wrote a paper as far back as 2005. So what was that? Eight years ago, I wrote mm-hmm. a paper in which we examined the saturated fat content in hunter-gatherer diets, and it was nowhere near the recommendations of the American Heart Association or the USDA, which they say, hey, get your saturated fats below 10% of calories. Right. There was no hunter-gatherer diet that had that low of a saturated fat. It typically was between right around 15 to, to 17% of total energy. Mm-hmm. And so I came out with that scientific paper in 2005, yet there are still people today that are saying that Cordain is obsolete, his ideas are off, and I, you know, I completely reversed direction almost eight years ago on that issue. Yeah. The canola oil issue, um, if you look at the fatty acid composition of canola oil, it's very high in an 18-carbon omega-3 fatty acid called alpha-linolenic acid. And mm-hmm. that's a very healthy omega. That's what we want to do. We want to get alpha-linolenic acid in our diet. It's a healthy omega-3 fatty acid. It's a short change fatty acid. It's not a 20-carbon fatty acid, and 20-carbon fatty acids are what really uh, reduce inflammation. So 18-chain are good, but not as good as what we find like the EPA and DHA in fish oil. Sure. So, so canola oil, at least on the surface, if you look at its fatty acid composition, it contains about 60 to 70 percent um, of alpha-linolenic acid. But the problem is, is it's made from a plant called rapeseed, mm-hmm. and uh, they changed the name of rapeseed. The Canadians did. They developed a, a, a breed of rapeseed that was very low in a fatty acid called erucic acid, E-R-U-C-I-C. Mm-hmm. And erucic uh, acid in animal models at even uh, higher concentrations, typically canola oil has less than 2% erucic acid, but mm-hmm. at higher concentrations in animal models, it causes cardiovascular problems. And so there was some recent uh, work that came out from Japan in the late 2000s showing that canola oil, even at low concentrations, uh, can have cardiovascular complications. And um, people found out, particularly uh, people that are involved in asthma and other allergies, Mm -hmm. is that rapeseed oil contains allergens that tend to aggravate uh, asthma and and allergies and dermatitis. So that information, again, is new, and I didn't know about that in 2000 because it didn't exist. Right. And so as hopefully as a good scientist, when we have better data, the data should drive the ideas. And so 
in my newest book, I reversed the position on the canola oil based on, on that idea. And I don't have any problems with that. And I think that um, even lay people should be able to uh, try to think in that manner as to when some, a better idea, better data comes along, is to change, change the way you think. Right. And so right. so that's, that's why my position on canola oil and saturated fats has changed distinctly since 2000. Yeah, well, at least the folks on this call will know that. So tell your friends, people out there, because right? <laughs> you've actually well, you, been. You, you reach a pretty wide group of people, so uh, hopefully they'll tell their friends, and it'll be kind of like paleo. It'll get out there. But once again, uh, you know, we're fine-tuning this concept, and uh, the concept itself will never be incorrect. Right. It'll continue. It, it will become um, the template by which we judge all human diet. Mm-hmm. Now that that will be down the road, but it's not going to go away. It's not like Atkins or the Beverly Hills grapefruit diet or any of that. It it simply won't go away. It will simply get bigger and bigger and bigger because uh, we fundamentally have the, the, optimal human diet correct. Right. And we'll hone it over time. We're never 100% correct, but we're definitely trending in the right direction and, and starting from the right place as well. Yeah, and, and once again, too, I, I think the other caveat that I've always tried to include in this is, is to listen to your body. So mm-hmm. some people, nuts don't work. Some people have allergies to nuts. Some people have allergies to shellfish, mm-hmm. and they, they simply can't eat it. So um, even though uh, on paper shellfish and nuts are seemingly healthy for most people, uh, some people can't eat it. Yep. And the same way with tomatoes is that if you've got autoimmune disease, and I've written about this, and your listeners can go to my website and see the papers that we've written, is believe it or not, something that seems as completely healthy as tomatoes actually in some people uh, can tend to aggravate and promote autoimmune disease. It's amazing. It really is. Well, I know you're just about out of time, uh, Lauren, so why don't you tell the folks out there where they can find you and uh, what you're working on now? Hey, Abel, thanks a lot. Uh, You can Google my name, and uh, my website comes up. I believe we are still number one on Google search engine for paleo. All right. The Paleo Diet, www.thepaleodiet.com. And uh, we've got a blog, got a website, uh, got all my scientific papers available for free, and lots of other goodies uh, can be found uh, at my website for free. Um, What is my latest project? I... I'm in the swan song of my career, believe it or not. I'm 62 years old, and I've been at CSU for 32 years now. Wow. And, yeah, it, it, and it's been a, a wild ride, particularly the last 10 years or so, with this whole idea of paleo getting so big. But I'm sure. What we're, we're working on right now is trying to nail mechanistically how paleo diets improve autoimmune disease patients, how they make things better. And one of the most exciting uh, studies that I'm involved with right now is we've, we've just completed a large case study with over 100 people that uh, adopted paleo, and um, we're looking mechanistically how uh, paleo seems to have helped them. Roughly 70% of these patients had an improvement or complete remission of their symptoms when they went paleo, wow. particularly the, uh, the irritable bowel, uh, Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis people uh, seem to do quite well on this. So uh, I appreciate you having me on the show, and uh, I'd like to get you uh, on my show as well. So <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll trade off because I want to hear your story. Oh, that would be wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cordain. It's, it's been a pleasure, and you're welcome anytime. Well, thank you, Abel. Thanks so much for listening, folks. We have plenty of awesome guests coming up on the show in the next few weeks. We have James Clear next week, Gary Taubes, Mira and Jason Calton, and I'm even trying to get Richard Simmons on the show, believe it or not, so we'll see if that works out. Now, in the meantime, come hang out at fatburningman.com or head on over to my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash fatburningman and come say hello. All right, I hope you guys have a great week and I'll be talking to you soon. Cheers. Cheers.